one of the most influential um, relationships of my life, romantic relationships, was with a man who was not black. And so my mother, in her civil rights, you know, understanding of all of this, sitting at lunch counters, right? The only thing she could do to rationalize, and she wasn't angry about it, she was really just conflicted that she loved this man so much who loved her daughter, but he can't be white. Mm. Because mm. in her mind, white was like mean and manipulative. And you know, you don't, it's not, it's not a play, thing that we mix with, right? right? So I can just remember her saying to me on several occasions where I'd be like, Mama, sorry, no, no, no. She'd be like, oh, but he ain't white. And I'd be like, are you looking at the same man? I mean, he right here, he sleeps in your house. Like we, you see him every day, he's white. And, but you know, it took her a while to rationalize just that we're saying that there's not a monolithic black, right? There's not a monolithic hate field white. Yep, absolutely. And, and I think it's so interesting because right there, that's kind of a race thing. It's also a generational thing where whiteness meant the, the lack of safety. Yes. Uh, and so, and I think that's, you know, changing. I think that's very much real for many black people still to this day. But I do think like generationally things can change. And I mean, it was illegal to, to, to not be with your own race for more years than not in this country. And so, um, and you know, I, I just, I think the interracial marriage and dating is something that we're seeing much more, much, much more, um, which ultimately is a great, I, I mean, it's a good thing in many ways. Some people have different opinions about what that actually means for um, specific races, but I think it's a generational thing that we're gonna see more and more of, and that's kind of the trajectory. Yeah, you know, for me, I think now that I'm older, you know, the world is changing. I see it as, I see it as a, a question of choice and permission, right? Um, and again, you know, we could be saying some things up here that people might not agree with, you know, it's okay. You don't have to think like I think. Um, but loving someone who the world believes is so different than you actually teaches you what love is. That's right. There's power in that. Yeah. And I think even undergoing that, whether you decide to stay married, whatever you decide to do for the rest of your life. But even if it's a friendship, like that undergoing that process of excavating how you and this other human being are similar, regardless of what it looks like. Yeah. Right? Yep. That's something that we take for granted. Yeah. I mean, I think about this specifically with, I've got a group of 13 really close Middlebury um people that I stay in touch with. And, you know, we're on, I mean, they're in my corner right now. I can see them group chatting me and they're popping up. Um, they, don't know, they don't know I'm doing this right right at this moment, but um, there's a, there's three of us that are black, no, two of us that are black and everyone else is white. And we've, we've had conversations, deep, meaningful conversations around race and how I show up versus they show up. And I think that um, the power of dialogue, the power of being in friendship and close proximity in multiracial spaces does ask a lot more of us. Um, and I do think that that is in many ways when we can get that right and laugh and, and, uh, and cry together and you know, all of the things that we've done over the last 15 years, 14 years, 14. Um, you know, that is, that is love. And I think that that's really what we're all trying to do a little bit, a little bit better, so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a long trajectory, right? Like. I I think about this often because I think about being the mother of a young black man who's growing up in Vermont, right? And I think about how he understands the world. And sometimes I, you know, the opposite, this comes to me because the opposite of love is fear, right? And so what comes up for me when I think about how much I love him is my fear that he might leave this place and not know enough to be who he is in America, yeah. right? You know, yeah. I'm poking you a little bit to be like, what, how did you, how did you, how are you surviving in Chocolate City? Like what's yeah. happening? Listen, I love it first, um, but, but second, but second, um, that's a, I think that, sh I, I mean, as a black mother, I, you know, I, I'll, I won't be that in my life, but I think that is a real fear. Um, and my, 
my white mother, that was a fear of my white mother. So she did as many things as she could to, to put me in positions and places with other black folks for a long time. That was shout out to Josie, my, my, my hairdresser uh, back in, back in, back in elementary and middle school. Uh, she's still, she's still around. So hit her up if you need, but um, we also would take trips and also sports brought me into more, into more diverse places and spaces. And that's what my parents tried to do, but ultimately I didn't get much of that. And I think a lot of, I think personality has to do with it. I think there's so many things, nature, nurture, but I did have two other friends growing up that were black and adopted by two, two white parents. And all three of us ended up very different people and moving in very different spaces. And I think there's, you know, conversation is, is, is great and trying to at least put some, a platform, some structure around what it is to be black without giving that fear of like, you have to watch your back every, you want them to live free, but you also want them to know who they are and where they came from. Um, but like that black, that black Southern thing, like you can, I think you can still do that anywhere, obviously. Yeah, I mean, he has to do that. I mean, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, there's butter in the rice. Like, come on, that's you know, there's gravy. There's I, I want to be, I want to be invited to the next uh, catfish thing. No, in the we, tried, we actually, I'm so country that I'm trying to be healthier, Andrew. But my best friend has me drinking this celery juice in the morning, and I was like, there's got to be something else to do with this celery pulp besides put it in the compost. <laughs> Listen, if you drink the celery juice in the morning, you I, I'll, I'll eat the fish fry at night. How so, so here's what I did, because I was like, listen, it's healthy. I, it's got to taste like something. So I took the celery pulp, mixed it up with some red onions, some carrots, some, you know, some other things, and some Jiffy Mix, and made some fritters. Okay, okay. <laughs> some celery, some celery root fritters. It's I'm, delicious. I'm, I'm name good for it. This is what I'm saying about you could take the country out of the, the girl out of the country. You can't take the country out of the girl. And like, anytime I do something like that, my neighbors, I send them a text when I'm like, you want to try something? They're like, please, what is it? What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I I mean, yeah. I've gotten some, some great, some great crawdad boils down here. And it's so funny because DC is right on the mix too, right? So there's so, and it's a, it's a transplant city. So there's a lot of Northern folks that come down. There's a lot of Southern folks that come down and just right on the edge, but it, it does have some, I mean, Virginia's right here, Maryland's right here. Um, it's a very complicated place because Virginia, you know, capital, yeah. capital of the Confederacy. And then we've got, and it just a, it's a wild place to see so many people kind of intermixing, but uh, Chocolate City is, has done, done me well. I, I really love it here. Um, it's a great place. I mean, it's like, you know, you know, ta calls Howard, you know, the Mecca, right? Like you could just walk and see so many cultures. I lived in Tacoma Park for a little bit. My family's in Silver Spring, but yeah, it's like a, it's, it's a melting pot. That's why I moved. I mean, you could see every sort of blackness that, that I, that I could imagine here and, and, and they welcome me and I welcome them. So it's great. Listen, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure we're already out of time. Um, but I would love to, uh, I'd love to, you know, continue conversations. And I just want to thank you for all the work you're doing with the anti-racism task force. Um, it's, you know, extremely important work. So just really appreciate that. Um, thank you. Yeah. You're doing a great job too. I mean, the alums who like you, who stay so connected are a part of really something that, you know, I really didn't understand about Middlebury until after I had been on the faculty for a while and was, I think I was in the airport and I had on like a t-shirt or something. And someone was like, you're, and I was like, uh, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> yeah, it's strong. It, it, the alum are strong. Yes, because, right, I mean, last point I'll make about like this different generation of blackness, right, is that, you know, in my day, you could only understand that type of connection and social structure and strata and navigation through something that, you know, like if what you were saying about being around different communities of other black children, that was through like Jack and Jill, or when you got in college, it was like pledging a fraternity or a sorority. Right. And, you know, every, now that Kamala, my soror, is the VP, right. I've had 
explain to people, you know, what that really means. But yeah. every January when I'm teaching J term, I wear my lime jacket. I tell people, and it's you. I have to like really unpack it because there's this little snicker of like, huh, Crystal, you were in a sorority. I was like, not was, is. And and we're not talking about the same things here. No, we're not. <laughs> you know, like is right now would not do it. Like you know, so yeah. the kind of social strata that was you had to navigate or put yourself into to have that same network that Middlebury gives is, you know, really amazing. Yeah, I agree. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, it's just been great. And uh, for everyone listening, thanks for tuning in to Leaning Into Discomfort presented by Middlebury Athletics and really hope you can tune into this one and many more. Thanks, everybody.